All right, next up we have a concept, Electronic Medical Records and Genomics, or EMERGE, and Rob Rowley, a program director in the Division of Genomic Medicine, will be presenting this concept. Over to you, Rob. Uh, you can hear me okay? I'll probably move this a little closer. Well, thanks, Jen. And uh, before I get started, I do want to take a shout out to the EMERGE team. And that team is very extensive. It's beyond the NIHGRI team, but uh, this is not possible without all of them. The other thing I did want to thank is ERP. They've provided significant input on this to help us kind of put this together and kind of think through it. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Emerge Network has been around. I've had the fortune of actually taking over to a different phase. But it's been around since 2007 with really the goal to ask the question, can electronic health records be used for genomic medicine research? And I think over the years, we continue to show that. But over the years, it actually has evolved, the network has evolved to actually taking on this new part, which is can genomic risk be integrated into clinical, clinical decision making? And so you might remember Emer Kenny gave a, in February, gave an update on the Emerge network. Um, from, and so we really appreciated that. But just to go through real quickly in terms of the background, the goal of the current phase is to measure the effect of the genome-informed risk assessment, or what the network has coined a JIRA. Um, I will use that term over and over again. But the JIRA is, includes genomic data, family health history, and clinical risk factors to understand a patient's or a participant's uh, ten risk for 10 common diseases. With the idea that network will measure participant and provider behavior in a prospective cohort study consisting of 25,000 diverse participants. Um, so we recognize this is a very rich data set, and we're starting to get that data set, and we understand there's many questions that could be answered. Or, but that being said, we came up with two critical questions. And the first one really is, are providers more likely to recommend a risk-reducing intervention for participants? when they're found to be high risk versus a control group. The second one is, are the participants with high risk JIRA more likely to undertake the risk reducing intervention? So there's on one hand, did, was it, did the provider actually take the action and then did the patient take the action once they got that information? Um, how are we gonna really understand the question? This is going into the eMERGE research study design. Once an individual is enrolled, the first thing is actually collecting samples, which includes monogenic testing and polygenic testing. We have two different labs doing each of those. We also have questionnaires that are going to each of the participants, and they fill those out electronically. That information is captured. And then we also have the electronic health records. So there's a lot of data moving around. But that is um, combined into what the JIRA is, or the Genome Informed Risk Assessment that combines all that data into a report. That information is then returned um, in person to the high-risk individuals, and then all patients actually receive the JIRA report into the electronic health record. And from there, uh, we measure uh, new health behaviors, so really looking at process outcomes at 6 and 12 months. Um, there are many outcomes that we are measuring, such as um, uh, measures performed in test orders. One of them, some of them are weight, cholesterol level, medications prescribed. So if someone's high risk for diabetes, should we look to see did they get prescribed a metformin? Uh, surveys to participants are captured, also to providers. Referrals to specialists, that's an interesting thing. That's a whole discussion in itself and how you capture that. But there's also procedures performed, whether it's MRI of the breast for a high risk of JIRA for breast cancer or a colonoscopy. And the last thing here is disease development. And we are capturing that information, recognizing we will not have significant data probably to answer those questions, but we're going to still have it and it's going to be a rich data set. Um, so how are we looking to do the overall analysis of the framework is, again, we've already recruited over 25,000 diverse individuals, 20,000 of those are adults, 5,000 of those are children. From that, we divide those into JIRA high risk and JIRA not high risk, recognizing that per, for each condition, 2 to 3% two to of those will be high risk for each condition, but compositely it would be around 25%. But in the JIRA high-risk individuals, we'll return those in person, as I mentioned. And then what we'll do is those recommendations will be based on the JIRA. Um, will also be included in the report. And right now, we're anticipating 6,250 individuals in that. And again, the composite for all the um, conditions combined would be around 25%. That being said, we also have the population for JIRA not high-risk, 
We'll return those via the electronic health record or electronic medical record and, or through the portal or through the mail. Once that information, there is no recommendations for those individuals. So in, essentially we're looking to see if they uh, follow standard of care. Um, and we're anticipating that 18,750 or 75% of those individuals will be in that cohort. Um, going into clinicians acts on, we'll look to see if clinicians act on the recommendations. So this is really um, looking at the provider response to the information in both of these cohorts. And then what we can do is we can look at the differences in orders, referrals, and encounters between those two. Um, going into participant receives a risk-reducing intervention or the participant is diagnosed with disease. So we'll have both of those. Those are a little bit um, more difficult to measure. But we'll do the same for participants that are not high risk, looking at the differences in new diagnosis or treatments. So we understand that there'll be process outcomes, and we've recognized those are the easiest to always capture. The harder ones are the clinical outcomes. And we do expect to capture those in both cohorts um, and analyze the overall and st stratify those by condition. So we'll be able to look at it in total. Did providers, high risk versus not high risk, did they respond differently than um, looking at the individual conditions? So the network has been extremely busy. I, I think there'll be some people in the room that would say that's an understatement, but I will say this is that there's been a lot of accomplishments over the last several years. We finalized the PRS for 10 common complex diseases in diverse populations. We've actually developed electronic health record-based method for return of the JIRA, and then we recruited and genotyped 25,375 diverse participants and provided a portion of them and their providers with the JIRA. And then we measured the adoption of risk reduction strategies and their impact on clinical outcomes at six and 12 months. That being said, in terms of our reaching goals, this is high risk participants observed versus expected. This table just as a, in short is showing you that we're reaching, we're essentially, um, the expected is equaling the observed in terms of the high risk individuals. Um, this table looks at the conditions per outcome. So there's the process outcomes. We also understand there's participant outcomes, again, looking did they, was it ordered and was it, did the clinician act on or the participant act on it? Um, but looking at this, if you take action for any high risk participant and you compare this to the participants that are not high risk, we recognize that this is, the study is powered at 90% to detect a three to 4%, 4.7% difference between those two populations. So another way of saying that if in the not high risk, there are 10% um, of those individuals are getting the procedure if the high risk got 14.7%, we'd be able to detect that. Um, so really looking at the preliminary outcomes, and just to give a little bit of baseline of this data, we know that the preliminary outcomes is very limited, and so don't make too many conclusions based on this. But we have three months of data on the participants that we do have the preliminary analysis on with an average about eight months. That being said, you can see here, this is the results for the uh, per condition for adults. Um, for breast cancer, prostate cancer, and type 2 diabetes, there's a statistically significant difference. So just going into a little bit detail there on the breast cancer, um, if you look at that, 17.5% of the, the participants that are identified as high risk undergo an MRI of the breast versus 1.2% in the not high risk. Um, and you go into prostate cancer, you see that difference is not as significant, but it is a significant um, between the two, and then type 2 diabetes, which is 45.7 versus 32.9, which there's a lot of interesting things about all three of those. That being said, um, if you look at children, um, there is a statistically significant for type 1 diabetes. You can see the numbers are much less, but there's an 18.9 versus 0 0.6 for islet cell autoantibodies, which are used to detect if someone's going to go on, that's high risk, on to type 1 diabetes. Um, and so you can see there's a statistically significant difference. Over on the right-hand side, you will see type 2 diabetes. And I think the confidence interval shows you the small sample size. But we have a 33.3 versus a 12%, which is not statistically significant with that small number. Um, so really, hopefully all that helps you understand why we're proposing to actually go on to a, um, an extension to capture outcomes. Um, some things that need to be considered, screening guidelines as you know, you just don't get screened once for these conditions. You get screened uh, for all 10 conditions. Their ongoing surveillance is needed. Adherence to many behavioral changes, we know decline over time after the initial intervention. 
and then pr participants and providers' actions as well as effects on clinical outcomes for the juror return should continue be well beyond 12 months. And then you might remember when this was presented before to council in February, there was a strong recommendation that this is a diverse cohort of 25,000 individuals and we should continue to follow them. Um, this is a list of extended follow-up and this shows you, just kind of adds some meat to the other thing that I said is that there's going to be need for continued follow-up and some are annual, some are periodic and others really don't have clear guidance and I think really as you understand as you take care of these patients that there's really not clear guidelines but I think this data set could actually help us begin to understand how should we make guidelines for these individuals that are found to be high risk. Um, this is a timeline just to kind of help you understand how the current phase of, uh, aligns with the proposed phase. Um, we are currently here. We've already completed uh, participant enrollment. We've also uh, planned to return the, all the JIRAs by January 2025 and really do the preliminary primary out outcome analysis by uh, April of 2026. What we are proposing is to extend this for uh, four more years to capture outcomes. In turn, that time we'll, t we'll do long-term process outcomes. We recognize there might be some uh, discussion about uh, reassessing the JIRA. We'll act in April of 2029, we'll start to finalize the analysis of long-term outcomes, and then also at the end, deposit the data on Anvil. One thing I think is very exciting is, as you look at this data sets, it's very rich. We're already, the network is already working with the Anvil team to make this data available through controlled access. Um, so the purpose is to extend uh, for one, a minimum of one year to four years, and then assess adherence to, um, the, to outcomes on the JIRA-based preventive recommendations among clinicians and participants, and then really look for what are the correlates of adherence um, with this uh, um, data set in terms of both participants and providers, and then really look at what social determinants of health, health we can actually start to understand why people are compliant. And then the last thing is just a kind of a little background. We originally thought when we put this first phase, of, this current phase of eMERGE together, that we could think about doing a clinical trial. And we recognize there's really a lot of missing data to be able to do that. We do hope that this data set can help contribute to understand such, thing, such things as effect size and inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, in terms of the scope and objectives, we have two funding opportunities, a single source NOFO for a coordinating center and a limited competition uh, for the 10 clinical sites recognizing the possible need for JIRA updates. Well, outcomes will be collected for e by EHR review. So just to let you know that all 10 of these sites are connected electronically so they can actually exchange that data to do the analysis. That will require compiling the data, cleaning it, and harmonizing it. And then really to understand if, whether we'll need participant and provider surveys in this extension. Um, one of the questions that might come up is why are we offering a single source and a limited competition, but also what, is, what does this mean? It does limit the applicants to the existing network investigators, and this is just going through a few of our rationales in terms of uh, proposing this. One, it's an already established diverse cohort of 25,000 individuals, and follow up, the, uh, uh, we can capture electronic health record data on all these participants because they are enrolled. We would need to continue to have those sites to be able to capture that data. And the informatic infrastructure is, is um, as you might remember from Emer Kenny's talk, is pretty significant and it is custom built and would be very uh, difficult to transfer or adopt by other sites. And there's the, the governance and, and things of single IRB and the data use agreements, those are no simple task. Uh, I think I heard from one investigator they had to go through 37 committees to get something done. I won't, um, but that all being said, it's a very difficult process in, uh, to connect to all these sites. That all being said, we are anticipating this uh, $6 million total cost per year for a total of, or for four years for a total cost of $24 million. We are proposing UO1 mechanisms will, will be used. Um, now we're looking for council input, and then we'll have to vote on the con approving the concept. We have a few questions here in terms of are there other outcomes um, that you would suggest we follow and then other characteristics that we might look at in terms of observing differences in adherence of follow-up. But that being said, we've ex ex asked doctors by root and um, um, brothers to uh, start the conversation. Dr. By root. So um, I'm extremely supportive of the follow-up of this eMERGE proposal. There are numerous strengths that uh, have been built up during this past uh, funding period. 
with a large sample size of 25,000 individuals. I um, commend you for including children in this. Thank you. There's diversity of the different types of illnesses that you're looking at mm -hmm. with uh, different types of physicians involved, so different types of providers and um, you know, different types of follow-up and, and outcomes. So this, what has been built has now been these um, genomically informed risk assessments, which has been important for the entire scientific community of how do you do that? How do you do that across uh, diverse samples? And now that you've built this, it makes complete sense to do the longer term follow up to see what the outcomes will be in these participants that you've returned with the results. So I commend what you guys have, are doing. It is the right thing to do. And the data set will only become richer with longer term follow up. Great. We think so too. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Um, I think this was an audacious idea when it was first <laughs> proposed. And I think. You know, we're going to go over the this funding period of time from it being an audacious idea to actually knowing whether or not it works. And so I think extending out in order to get those outcomes is really critical. Uh, otherwise, the next time this is proposed, it'll be audacious again, right? We just you, <laughs> right. You, you, we're trying to get answers. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there's just a very general problem of studies like this lasting long enough. The funding mechanisms make it hard to get these long-term outcomes, and I think this is one case where it's very critical to do that. So I'm yeah. very supportive. Just, yeah. Kelly? I didn't actually see mentions. A lot of these diseases, they have co comorbidities. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so how are you handling that? Like, is if somebody has a high risk factor for one disease, are they, are you looking to see how they react to screening for all of the diseases? I mean, how are you, how are you considering the comorbidities, like uh, type two diabetes and stroke? I'm not sure of the 10 things that you're actually asking for. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's interest there. I mean, if, if you look at the data we're actually capturing, that in terms of how many people are high risk for more than one condition, and there's three, I think there's several individuals that have had four. Um, and so the question is those over, I, I think there's a lot of questions that we haven't answered in terms of what that's going to mean. But it's, it's fascinating because I think we have, at least clinically, we always think of these things overlapping. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if those overlaps are consistent with the data. And I, I think we're gonna have to figure that out. Um, there is, we do know some of these individuals already have the disease. I think there is an interest, of, there's some interest in the network in terms of understanding how those people perceive that they have type two diabetes, but they're not found to be high risk. How do you communicate that? And so the network has worked on that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of questions like that, that the network is working in, with the patients. And we do have a few supplements to kind of understand that better too. So thanks for the question. Bruce? Yeah, I should probably know this being at one of the sites that's involved, but <laughs> it, it doesn't shock me that the high-risk group would have more screening tests than the not high-risk group. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if it's um, of interest to look at whether the not high-risk group has less screening than people who didn't participate at all. Is there a potential for, I guess you could call it false reassurance, that you've been found not to be at high risk so Therefore, you don't need to have, you know, mammogram screening yep. that would otherwise be recommended, for example. Yeah, so, the, well, you can look at some of the data, which is interesting, because we, we, we stratified if they're greater than 40 for MRI of the breast versus less than 40 with MRI of the breast. Well, what we're seeing, at least in the preliminary data, is there's not a significant difference in that uptake. What's interesting in that is if you take individuals that are less than 25 that get the JIRA, are they falsely acting on that, so that's one question. But your question is, are they falling away? So um, there might be some good in that too. If you look at the type two diabetes data, will you actually see those two, because right now I was surprised at the number of people that are getting the hemoglobin A1C and the fasting glucose that are not high risk. So and as we all know, they're commonly ordered, but you would think that maybe hopefully that would separate, but this data is not gonna help us do that. But those are the kind of things is that we're gonna have to look to see if there, there is some divergence over time. And that's one reason to actually capture the longer term outcome data to answer that, hopefully. Uh, Judy? Yeah, um, 
What's your estimates in terms of dropout? I mean, it's clearly mm-hmm. essential. The yeah. essential next step is to look at the four-year outcomes. But like, what's your estimates in terms of dropout? I think your power calculation may have included that. Um, yeah, that's my yeah, first so, question. Yeah, so we looked at the same. T- so the number, I didn't put it up there, but if we actually lost 50% of the participants, which we're not anticipating, we'd still have, I think it goes up to 5.3%. So that 10% versus 15.3, we'd still have the power to detect that. But and if, we're anticipating, I mean, anticipating, if you look at across clinical trials, usually it's somewhere between, I mean, the good ones are 10% probably to 20%. I'm sure there's some, yeah, there's outliers there. And then if your major outcome is process, mm-hmm. um, how, how are you controlling for process? I mean, they know their, they know the results. And so are you able to contr- control between the high risk and the not high risk? Or you're just, it's observational anyway. It's observational. It's a prospective cohort. Yeah. It's, yeah. Got it. Yeah. So this is definitely a hypothesis generating exercise. I mean, we're going to answer some questions. I think we're going to, the data is going to be rich there. But it, that's one thing we're hoping to have that data for. Tim? Thank you. Um, so this is great. You mentioned data release at the end, but you've already released some data, right? As I'm seeing on DB Gap, or is that not true? No, there's a, okay. well, Emerge being around since 2007 has definitely, so yeah. there's legacy data sets that's 105. Right. Uh, yeah, so there's no current. Yeah. Is the, why wait till 2030 to release, or is there incremental releases that well, could we make sense? Will, we will definitely work on getting that. I mean, the requirement is at the end of the project. That they, sure. Yeah, but that being said, I mean, yeah, we'll have to make those decisions. As, and that's why we're working with the Anvil team to kind of work out some of those things in terms of how do we make that available um, through controlled access. Yeah, just I, I worry if you wait till the end that it takes a long time and the project's yeah. already wrapped up and you might have more uh, community buy-in if you yeah. release some, some of what's available now. Yeah, and, and, and to be honest, I mean, that's why the hesitancy on showing data right now is right. we just are getting the data now. Sure. And it really does need to be cleaned up, and we need more of it. So there's, uh, that's it's definitely I'll emphasize again that's preliminary results, and yep. but uh, it does show that we could find that long term we could see some evidence that there's changes or differences. Next time. Anybody else? All right. Motion to approve. Second. All right. Everybody approving. Hands up. And that's everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.